All right, good morning, everybody, and welcome back to True Crime Loser. I hope you're doing well. So today, I want to talk about John DuPont. Mm. This guy's family makes George Hughley V look poor. The DuPont family. Pardon me, do you have any grape DuPont? Um, so the DuPonts are a, or have been one of the richest American families for a really long time, and they made a lot of their money selling gunpowder during the wars, and then they got into chemical, like fertilizers and stuff, and became one of the biggest chemical factories, and then got into the automotive industry, and they just amassed some serious wealth. And John was a... Um, I guess an heir to that whole wealth and they lived in this huge estate in Pennsylvania that has a massive like mansion and then all these guests house and John as a kid this guy he didn't have any real friends and I don't know if it's because of his upbringing or just something about... It's probably a little of both, but I saw a thing that he ate all his meals alone in his room until he's 13. And uh, you don't really get too socialized if a maid... Hmm, Mr. DuPont, here is your lunch again. And you gotta be at school eating lunch with all the kids, and then if you do something unlikable, everyone makes fun of you, and then... You don't want to do that unlikable thing anymore because everyone called you a nerd and a loser. And so he didn't really have any socialization. And, um, and which made him extremely unlikable. And so he's one of these rich kids that doesn't have any friends and has everything in the world. Like there's a shot of him fishing in his own private fishery pond on the property, but he's alone. If you have something great, it's only great if you can share it with somebody. So if you're fishing alone, it gets old pretty quick. It's fun to be like, look how beautiful the sky is and the water and the grass. It smells so good. This is such a great day to be here together. But if you're just alone, you're like, the grass smells good. I think I'm going to kill somebody. And so DuPont grows up this super rich kid, has everything in the world except friends. Lots of movies and books have been written about that same type of thing. Everything in the world but friends. Um, and then also... It's just him and his mom. There's no siblings are older. His dad left. I kind of have a feeling after trying to figure, watch all the stuff on this case is, <laughs> excuse me, I have a feeling that the dad wasn't too impressed with John as a kid. And I heard the mom was a little bit hard to be around as well. And so he left. So there's no dad, no siblings. And it's just John and the mom on this giant... Mm, DuPont estate in Pennsylvania and the mom is obsessed with horses thoroughbred horses and she competes I think you just show your horse or the horse runs or I don't know I don't know how you compete a horse other than like riding it but her horses win a bunch of trophies and trophies and ribbons become really important to this family they have like these trophy rooms that they show off. This is the DuPont family trophy room. Because we don't have any friends, we have trophies, okay? Friends are overrated, but hanging out with a trophy is actually pretty fun. And so winning trophies for these horses were, was a huge deal for the mom and the family. And so as DuPont, as John, little John, gets older and he is, uh, like I said, he's just socially really off-putting. People 
I think kids that tried to hang out with him or as he grew up, people that tried to socialize with him, he would do something that he's got this really weird speech pattern. If you watch the videos of him where he'll say something and then he pauses for a really long time. So it'll be like this right here is the DuPont family trophy room. And we have won trophies over decades, and there are over two fucking thousand, and you're just like, huh? I'm sure kids, I'm sure kids were just like, mom, this dude sucks. I'm not inviting John DuPont to my birthday. I'm sorry. He's weird, okay? And he has this weird way of looking down like my nose I've broke my nose a bunch of times so my nose is crooked and weird but he's got this giant weird nose that he kind of looks down on people on and mm, oh, I'm rich and um and I would say I don't know for sure but I would say after a while just him and his mom's relationship got a little bit weird just living on this estate together I think he really started to want to impress her or want to show her that he was a success on his own or something. But he also wanted to rebel. He didn't want to do the horse thing. They had all these horse, like champion horses or something. And kind of reminds me of the drummer from Cream. Uh, what's his name? Baker. He would always buy a bunch of horses and blow all his money. But anyway, so they, so John is on this, still just on the, has all the money in the world except for real friends. And so as he's growing up, I don't know if he does it on purpose, but he sort of figures out a way to buy the friends that he's always wanted in, in ways that, um, I don't know. I don't know if he had thought, okay, I'm going to buy friends or thought I'm going to become a philanthropist and then people are going to become my friends. So what he would do is, so one of his first goals and I think fantasies was he wanted to be law enforcement and he wanted to be known as this like tactical master gun toting law enforcement badass. And he, the way he did that is he donated a ton of money to the police station in the area. And so this is a, this is a, a pattern that you'll see in John's life where he'll donate so much money to something that people almost just have to accept him. And so I picture, you know, this one is, they're like, yeah, yeah, John, old John DuPont wants to, wants to be an honorary cop. And they're like, no, fuck that. Like, the, why would we do that? And then they're like, well, he, he donated $500,000 and everyone's like, oh, invite him for beers, Johnny. John DuPont, DuPont. And so throughout his life, he would do this where he, he called himself a philanthropist. And he would, anything that he wanted to be a part of, he would just donate an obscene amount of money until everyone had to pretend that they were his friend. And it got more weird and intense as it goes. And so he donates all this money first to the police station. So they buy all the high tech gear with the DuPont money. And they're like, all right, maybe this guy's not too bad. And then. All the policemen in the town love hunting and are huge hunters. And John then opens up, lets them, the police force, hunt on his property. So if you don't hunt on the property, you hunt in normal hunting areas. You got to have the license and they do a limited amount of deer that you can shoot. And they tell you what you can shoot. But on the DuPont estate, there's really no rule. So they just could shoot a ton of deer and there's really no rules as far as hunting like there is off the estate like john would just drive around from inside his lincoln town car and <laughs> shoot out the window which is illegal if you're not on your own property and so the police loved this this farm they could just there was endless forest and they would all get multiple deers and there's footage of them being like yeah dupont baby and uh then he let a few of the sergeants of the police force move onto the property, live in guest house onto the property, and then they were in charge of 
allowing who gets to hunt. So it was this whole, like, you know, this whole system was set up, like, whether John planned to or not, like, you better pretend to be my friend or this hunting utopia paradise is all going to go away. I donated a bunch of money to the police force. So with all this, they become John's, you know, best friends. And so they make him an honorary police officer. He gets a uniform, which I think he's probably all he wanted. He gets, he gets invited to the dinners. They'd have a dinner where they bring him up in front of everybody and say, John DuPont is a hero of this police force, whatever. He's a hero. And John's up there just ugly as shit, just being like, thank you. I'm a, I'm a cop. Has nothing to do with the thousands and thousands of dollars I donated before anyone would talk to me, and uh, and so that was his kind of first. He wanted to be the pol- a, a badass policeman, and then so kind of the second chapter. At some point, the same way his mom was obsessed with horses and obsessed with winning these stupid w- ribbons and trophies and that giving her life's meaning, he rebelled against that and didn't want to do... Because horses are very like, hmm, I'm thinking I'm going to buy some horses. Like, you have to be rich to buy a bunch of horses or be in the thoroughbred horse game. And John's dream, more than anything in the world, was to be a winning, successful, professional athlete and to hang out with winning athletes and he just became obsessed with it. And the problem with him wanting to be an athlete is he wasn't fast. He wasn't talented. He didn't have good technique. He wasn't strong. He had a frail, kind of weird body. He uh, was a drunk and a cokehead eventually. And he, I mean, it just like wasn't even close to being an athlete. And, um, and, but similar to the whole law enforcement thing, how he wasn't even close to become a cop, he figured out a way to donate money until people pretended he was an athlete. And so how this looked is he became obsessed with wrestling, the Olympic sport of wrestling. And I'm going to take a break right there talking about John and talk about someone else and unfortunately. Fortunately, we can't talk about John DuPont without talking about Dave Schultz. And who Dave Schultz was is he was probably one of the best Olympians and wrestlers the United States has ever had. And he was essentially the exact opposite of John DuPont, almost like comic book-esque how opposite that they were. Dave Schultz had an amazing personality. He was just one of those people that everyone wanted to be around him. He had a beautiful wife. He had these great kids. Um, everybody loved him he, every, and wanted to be around with him. And, on, you know, he's a gr- amazing athlete and he's strong and um, just, a, just a great guy, really. And it's notable that we don't support our Olympic athletes in America, which makes it a huge struggle because, say for like a wrestler, you wrestle in high school, and then you wrestle, if you're really good, then you wrestle in college, and then you graduate from college at, what, like 22 or 23 at the latest, and then you, you know people win gold medals up through their 30s so there's was there's like 10 years of where you either have to coach or you have to have a day job or something on top of training the amount that you have to to compete in the olympics and so it put our wrestlers in a really vulnerable situation because a lot of them dave schultz he was at the top of our wrestling game so he was probably less vulnerable he had opportunities he had because he was like the name. If you knew anyone's name in wrestling, you knew Dave Schultz. And so he was a little bit less vulnerable than a lot of the wrestlers. But a lot of the wrestlers that are trying to make the Olympic team, 
were in tough situations. They were totally broke, eating like crap while also training all day, um, working day jobs that are taking energy away from training and... And uh, but th there's a dream is to win these gold medals, and out of that vulnerability, like I said, whether he planned it or just it was the right thing, he, we get old f Dupont coming into the situation, and the same way his mom bought a bunch of horses and wanted ribbons to be won, Dupont starts doing the same thing with wrestlers. So he doesn't go after Dave first because Dave, like I said isn't quite in desperate need as but some of the so he approaches other wrestlers and he says i've built this huge wrestling facility on my property and uh, also he built this swimming facility sort of like this giant olympic training ground right and he goes i've built this on my property i don't think it's fair that uh, countries like the russians support their olympic athletes and we don't because the russians Wrestling is in the best wrestlers come out of Russia, and the wrestlers uh, are plucked at a young age. And if they're showing talent, the government supports them and they nurture the talent, and they don't have to work and they get to just spend all this time and they become these, you know, insane wrestlers. So, for someone like Dave Schultz, an American to beat him is insane because he did it all himself. There's he, you know, there's no he didn't have any support, and to beat. A really good Russian wrestling machine that just turns out all these amazing wrestlers just to beat it with your own with your own uh, I guess journey is really impressive same thing is like Bobby Fischer beating the Russians in chess way back when is same thing the Russians they anyone that's showing talent in chess they take them in they support them they play the best people and little bobby fisher is just sitting at, in his apartment in brooklyn playing against himself you know no help no dad no anything and he beats him so great stories but anyway so he brings all these athletes that are just struggling financially and he says i'm gonna pay you a salary you get to live in a guest house you get all this great food cooked by the staff you get everything uh, you get totally supported, and you get to come out, and you wear, it was called Team Foxcatcher. You get to wear, you know, you get to be a part of Team Foxcatcher. And so all of these Olymp Olympians go out and start living on his property and being paid to do so. Well, for a while, it's a athletic utopia. It really is. For the first time, they're fully supported and they're training all day and they're not working these day jobs but there had to be a catch right and that catch was whether he planned it or not is if you're paying somebody to live on your property and to train for the olympics eventually in little ways john demanded more than just you know, training and being a part of the team. He wanted friendship. And it it turned into this really weird... And then at, at, after a while, he wanted to be considered a peer. And so, like, say you have, like, f 10 of these Olympic wrestlers that are just jacked and just totally chiseled, you know, and have been wrestling since they're five years old. And then all of a sudden... John is also dressed like a wrestler and is like wanting to drill with him. Well, he's this old, like 55 year old, his body, you know. And so he, these, he'll like grab one of these Olympic wrestlers and try to take them down, and they'll just have to pretend like, oh, John is doing it. He's strong. And uh, they made him pretend that the, the wrestlers basically had to pretend that John was one of them and was a wrestler, and he they would let him kind of horse around a little bit, and then they would. He wanted to be their coach, and so, if you're paying, if you're getting paid all this money, all of a sudden John is up there being like, "All right, so today, gentlemen," and he's 
walking around like coaches. You're not going to say like, John, you're not a coach. You don't know shit about wrestling. What are you doing? I mean, we, we love that we're here on the ranch and everything, but you're not. But they didn't say that because the whole money thing. It's sort of like the policeman that when he wormed his way into being an honorary police officer, they're like, don't say anything. You know, this is great. This is a great situation for us. The Olympics are coming. John is a little weird, but let's just let's just gut it out and deal with his uh, strangeness until until we can get you know to the Olympics and then if you want to leave the property well it just started getting weirder and weirder where he you know demanded being known as their coach and pretending that he's also a, an Olympic wrestler and just like any business relationship wrestlers would leave you know they'd be there for a while and then they would leave for normal reasons and he would take that as like his friends were leaving and he would get really obsessed with certain people um, and he'd want to be around them like this guy Sham. He's a great wrestler. He'd always want to be around Sham. And then it switched to this Bulgarian wrestler. And then actually John DuPont wa decided that he was Bulgarian out of the blue at one point. He was just like, he claimed like, I am Bulgarian. I've always been Bulgarian. And everyone was like, I think the name DuPont is French, DuPont. And he was like, yeah, well, I'm Bulgarian. I think I might do that too when I'm 55, just be like, hey, everybody, I'm now Bulgarian. And, um, and, it, and he started to drink a lot more and carry around guns, like a handgun, a lot more. And it started really kind of weirding people out. And he started doing cocaine a lot more. So he would just do a bunch of coke at like 11 at night and be all drunk and then just be all yacked out and wander around this giant property with a gun all night and all the wrestlers and all these athletes are saying god this is getting weird this is getting bad people are saying you should go and then that guy sham that i was telling you about he i don't know something happened and john all of a sudden wanted him off the property so he tells sham you got to get off this property um you got to leave and i want you gone and sham is sitting there like well I got a house packed full of stuff and I've lived here a while so I'll leave John but I can't just I can't just leave immediately it's going to take a while and John parked this big moving truck out in front of the guest house that he's staying in as a way to be like I want you out and anyway in the, in the meantime Dave Schultz kind of our main wrestling treasure in America had moved to the ranch with his family John had offered him just an offer he couldn't refuse um and so now Dave Schultz is there training, um, and John creates this old John Dupont pays this all this money to create like an old man wrestling league, and he, these other old guys wrestle him and are paid to lose. Well, he he make part of the deal is he makes Mark Schultz, or I mean, sorry, Dave Schultz. He makes Dave Schultz be his coach when he does these fake old man wrestling events so it just breaks my heart you can see footage of john in his wrestling singlet he doesn't have a wrestling body at all and he's in a fake match against some old guy that's paid to lose and our greatest wrestler one of our greatest wrestlers of all time mark is sitting there like like squeezing his biceps in between rounds and telling him like you know let your arm go and you got to think that Dave Schultz is just sitting there like, what happened? You know, you don't want to be, the lesson in this whole thing is you don't want to be bought. You, once you're bought, it's hard to, it's hard to stay true to yourself because you're just like, ah, oh, well, all this money's coming in. Yeah, sure, I'll coach this. I'll pretend to be coach. Or it's like, yeah, sure. And it just, it snowballs. And so you, all of a sudden you're doing things that are just against your soul. But it's like, oh, shit, the money it makes me comfortable, you know, this old guy. And then John's moods would just be all over the place. Like he would be in a good mood one minute or he would come in all coked out with a gun and be like, why isn't everybody working harder today? And that no one really knew what they were going to get. But again, it's like the Olympics were six weeks away at this point. So all the wrestlers amongst themselves are like, should we leave, you know? And like Dave, I don't know, he's... 
he's starting to have weird sort of feelings towards you, Dave, where one minute he'd be like, Dave is my totally best friend. And then the other times he would think that Dave was spying on him or had it out against him or was hiding in the walls or something. And people think he started to lose his mind, but I don't think you can really know with the amount of just coke that he was doing. The paranoia could have come from that, but people think he maybe slowly got schizophrenia. But then one day, Sham, who hadn't moved yet, is working out in one of the uh, training centers, and John DuPont comes in just all coked out and just puts a gun, puts a machine gun into his chest and says, I want you to be gone. And he's like, John, I'm leaving. Put the gun away. What the hell? And then, so they called the cops. Well, the cops, you got to remember of them, people, the cops, most of them, or not most of them, but a bunch of them live on the property. And their whole hunting utopia is on this property. John's donated a bunch of guns to them and uh, is an honorary member. And they know how eccentric he is. And so they're like, oh, we know John, you know, he didn't. He didn't mean anything by it. We know he's puts, you know, he's just a weird, eccentric, old rich guy, old DuPont. DuPont. And so it doesn't go anywhere. And um, during this time, people are leaving the ranch and just being like, this is too weird. And so Sham, the wrestler, says, all right, I got to get out of here. And he packs up everything in that moving truck. And on his way out... He stops by Dave Schultz's guest house and he says, Dave, can I leave my van here? I'm leaving. DuPont's a nut. You know, I got to go. Can I leave my van here? I'm going to take drive the moving truck away, but leave the van. And Dave's like, yeah, sure. You know, I think I'm going to stay here until after the Olympics, six weeks away. I don't want to uproot my training right now, but then I think we're going to leave too. You know, this whole thing is getting weird. And so Sham leaves, but DuPont sees that the van, Sham's van is still at uh, Dave Schultz's place. And he, I don't know if he thinks that Dave is letting Sham stay there or is going, you know, he, he wanted Sham to leave. So is he like, is Dave on Sham's side? He's got all these crazy, coked out old guy thoughts. And, uh, and then one morning it had stormed a lot. And, and like DuPont's morning security crew or whatever gets in and DuPont says, yeah, a lot of damage happened last night on the fences around the property. We need to get into a car and I want to show and it. Obviously, he'd stayed up all night. He's all. Ugh. And uh, so the head of security. Who this head of security started to sort of take advantage of DuPont had all these weird ideas like there's something. There's tunnels in the property and instead of this. His old head of security was saying, John, there's no one there. There's no tunnels under the... And so he fired him, and then he hired this new head of security that would just, okay, well, we'll dig. We'll get a backhoe here and dig out huge portions of the property. Or John would say, Dave Schultz is in the wall spying on me. And so this new head of security would say, okay, let's knock down the wall. And they'd knock down the wall. And people close to DuPont were saying, this is not what he needs right now. You know, if someone's saying the that, you know... The radio is talking to them or the newspaper is communicating with them. The last thing that you should do is say, yeah, it is. Let's look into it. So he's declining, declining. It snows and storms a bunch. And so he says, I want to show you the the damage that the proper, that the storm did to the property. So head security is like, okay. And John has a gun, which was weird, but not too weird. Once he got nice and drunk and coked out, he'd always carry a nice gun around perfect combination and so they get in the car and they're driving around and john's like this fence is broken and he's okay and then they drive up to dave schultz's house who's having lunch with his beautiful family and six weeks until the olympics and one of our just treasure wrestlers and a great guy everyone wanted to be around him essentially the exact opposite of DuPont and uh, he pulls up to Dave's house and Dave walks out kind of with a hey what's up John what's going on today and DuPont just sticks the gun out and shoots him dead and he just thought 
that I think he thought that Dave was making people leave or that Dave had something against him or that Dave made his brother Mark, who also won a gold medal, leave. And, you know, obviously just totally delusional, but he just shot him right in his right in front of his family. And it's just a such a terrifying situation. And then it got weird because they called the police again, who he's very intertwined with, and they're like, John DuPont shot someone on his property. And they were like, are you sure it was John? And they're like, yeah, John, you need to calm out here. And John then barricades himself in the huge house or in the huge uh, mansion that's on the property. And there's a tons of guns in there and there's a safe room in there and a vault that he can close himself in. And so for days, he just holds himself up in there and the SWAT has the whole uh, house and the whole estate surrounded and they're, they're just talking to him and he's just delusional. So they're like, John, we got to figure this out. And he'll be like, I am looking over some diplomatic papers. Oh yeah, that's another thing is he would tell people to call him Eagle or Golden Eagle so that you'd be like, hey, nice to meet you, DuPont. And he'd be like, people call me Eagle. It's like one of those nicknames you don't get to call yourself Eagle. If everyone starts calling you Eagle, that's awesome. But you don't just get to say, I am the Eagle. And so he just totally delusions of grandeur. He's like, I am discussing diplomatic papers right now. I can't come out of the house. And finally, it's in the middle of winter. They cut the power to the mansion. And he comes out of the back to try to turn the power back on they tackle him and arrest him and he goes for an insanity plea doesn't get it gets uh, life or close to life in prison and then ends up dying in prison at the age of 72 the dupont story all right i'm uh gonna cut it off right there this one got really long i hope you guys are having a great week and having a great weekend coming up uh, we got Crime Con one week from today. So if you're thinking, what am I going to do next weekend? I got you. Let's go to Crime Con together. The official, unofficial Crime Con coverage right here on True Crime Loser channel. I love you all, everybody. True Crime Loser out. Why? Stabbing why? Meet up.